Good morning, students. Welcome to the TEFS 701 Senior Phase Students, um, First Edition of Language Students. My name is Natalie Adams, and if you've listened to my week two recording, you would know who I am. For those who have registered late, welcome to the class, and I'm sure that we will have a wonderful year, prosperous year. So I think if, if you can just give me a minute, I would like to just share my screen with you. So just one minute. Okay, there we go. Okay, so let me get, so this is the TFS 701 Language Acquisition Theories Lecture. Um, this is semester one, we're now in week three, so there's, we've done quite a bit. So this week we're going to look at language acquisition, language and learning acquisition. So what is the difference between learning a language and acquiring a language? Now, as second language, as additional language teachers, you will obviously have to know how you acquire first language and a second language. But I think most importantly for you, that's going to become first additional language teachers. You need to also know how to acquire, how our learners acquire a second language. Now, as I've said earlier, you need to look at what is the difference between learning a language and acquiring a language. There's a huge difference, and we, we're going to talk about that today. Um, um, this Stephen Krashen is a very interesting theorist, and he says this, language acquisition does not require extensive use of conscious grammatical rules and does not require tedious drills. Now, most of you might think that this statement is not necessarily correct because um, our past experience might have shown that our teachers push this uh, conscious grab grammatical rules and require tedious drills but uh, Krashen is totally against this so he doesn't agree with the statement he believes that language is something that we acquire and it should be dealt with in a communicative way but I will speak about that as the later on in the recording Okay, so before we start, we just need to do a task roundup so that we know where we are. I'm, I'm also doing this because I'm aware that uh, students registered late so that they just have an idea of what is going on currently. Okay, so week two. So we have now completed the online tracking uh, quiz, the first one, the reflection essay that has closed. What I need to just uh, keep in mind is that I'm very aware of students that registered late. So I will be opening that uh, reflection quiz only for those people to complete. Okay, so I think I'll have it open from later today till Friday for you to complete it. Hopefully, most of you will be will be able to do it. Um, I, I know a few of you have emailed me about it. So I will just respond to your email, tell you when it's opened, okay? The mentor.com textbook survey is also a very important thing, students, because as you might know by now, we use the Ferreira textbook virtually all the time. If you do not have a copy of the textbook, I would advise you to get one because you're gonna use it for this semester as well as for the second semester. So please, we be constantly doing that survey. Please respond to it and I'm encouraging you to buy the textbook as well. So the menti.com, the task completed, that's also on menti.com. And, and the last one would be the Polani case study. That's also very, very important. And that's in Ferreira on, at, on page 52. Okay. Now, um, this is just a tracking task completion for now. Track, uh, the first reflection, the quiz has been closed. As I've said, I'll open it for certain students who have registered late. But yes, most of you have completed that task. Um, a lot of you asked me for a second opportunity, which I gave them. Yes, so I'm very happy and I'm busy marking, still marking the reflection task. I should have it done very soon. Also, students, what I need just to emphasize is that 
when you are doing a quiz online, especially the quizzes from quiz two to 10, it's marked automatically. You cannot get your mark immediately. I need to first look at everyone that have whether they have completed the task. I need to look at the closing date, et cetera, et cetera. And then I will release the marks. I can't do it beforehand because a lot of students have been inquiring about that. So please just complete the task and um, it will automatically, the canvas will automatically save it. And only when everything's completed will I then release the marks because I'm receiving emails about that as well. So just to, uh, keep that in mind. Now, unit one, we started out with the teaching methodologies. Um, so we, we looked at the principles of language teaching um, that was done during um, recorded week one and that Marcel Harry made, uh, did that recording. Uh, please, I was appointed later on and could, could not complete that recording during week one. So it's important that you actually go and have a look at Marcel's recording. It's when you go to your quick links one, you'll see the recording on Canvas. It's available to you. Please listen to it. All of it is available. I'm not sure some of you might have noticed that the videos are also on YouTube. So you can also go and have a look under Marcel Harris's name. So that's number two. Then we're looking at, so week one was the principles of language teaching. Then the second thing that we looked at was interrogating caps and the curriculum documents for language teaching. That's week two's video. And remember that um, that recording I did. So please, in order for you to complete your quiz two, you need to actually understand, you need to go and listen to that recording on the interrogating caps and the curriculum documents. So please do that. Um, I'm gonna focus now on language acquisition theories. And this you'll find in Ferreira chapter four, page 45 to 51. Please go and have a look at it again. Again, we need to be using Ferreira. So I'm hoping that you're getting the message that the book, buying the book is important. Okay, so language acquisition, there we have it. Um, so week three, which is now this week, it's this is the order that we're gonna go about this lecture. Firstly, we're gonna look at language acquisition order. Then after that, we're going to look at what the behavior says about language acquisition. We're also going to look at innatism, which is another theory of how we acquire our languages. We're going to look at the interactionalism, also another theory. And then we're going to look at second language acquisition theories, and that will be then crashing uh, multiple hypotheses. Okay, so it's very important that you understand these things because in order for you to, to, to do your quiz three, you're going to have to know all of this. So the first theory we're going to look at is the Larson-Freeman order of grammatical morphine acquisition for English learners. Okay, so what does it say? It says that a child uh, in its natural setting, so at home, in their environment, acquire languages the following ways. They said it first thing how they acquired is firstly with the continuous tense. So that a child acquires the ing first, uh, sleeping, sitting, eating. If you listen to a child, you sometimes wonder, uh, you know, they, they're always speaking with an ing at the end. The second thing that a child acquires in their natural environment would be this third person singular. So you always say, yeah, him say he sleeps, she sleeps, or it sleeps. And then the last one, which is, I suppose, the possessive, uh, the apostrophe S, is the most difficult one for a, a learners or your ch children, learners to acquire in their natural setting. So natural means at home, etc. Okay, so that's how are they acquired. First, the ing, then the singular, the third person singular, and then the possessives. Okay. In the classroom setting, it changes a little bit. And this is how they normally acquire language. They say there the first thing would be the third person singular, then the continuous tense, and then the possessive. So it changes a little bit there. Okay. Let's go on. 
Now, if you've noticed uh, both sides, whether it's in the natural setting or in the classroom environment, struggle with the possessive. So with possessive S. So we're going to do a little bit about that so that we can just see why they struggle. So the use of apostrophes, obviously that is a mistake there, but yeah, the reality is that students or our learners need to know about this. Note, now the first thing about the apostrophe use is that it always stands for it is or it has. Okay, so it is great weather or it has been great, it's great being here. So it stands in, so that's one of the functions of the apostrophe. It's normally when a word has been deleted and it says it is, okay? So yeah, we, if, if, if I look at the next one, it's a possessive, possessive uh, form. It's never has an apostrophe. So that's another one. The dog chased its tail. So whose tail is it chasing? It's chasing the dog. The dog is chasing its tail. So it's referring to the dog. So in that situation there, it never has an apostrophe because it, um, it refers to a possessive. Okay. Now, if you spot here the problem, you would look at, would you use an apostrophe when writing plurals such as DVDs, TVs, CVs, and PCs? No, of course you would not, okay? Which of the following plurals are correctly used? Okay, so we have specials. So there's avos, beans, and tomatoes. So which one has been correctly used? Because now, remember, here we are looking at plurals, where you just add the S and not an apostrophe S. So which one is correct? Obviously the beans, because bean, it would become beans because it's the plural form of it, okay? So there you do not use the apostrophe. And then when looking at the third one, we're looking at which of the following plurals are correct. The first one, tomatoes, Videos, avos, grade 12s, MPs, and bananas. It's obviously the first uh, uh, answer. So it's the first one, the tomatoes, the videos. That's without the apostrophe S. Okay. Now, when we, the second theory that we're going to look at would be the behaviorist. And that is what we call behaviorism. So the, the, the behaviorists uh, believe that child learns a language via education. It, it just pouring knowledge into an empty head and that's how a child learns, okay? So that's a very interesting theory, but obviously that's not what we um, are expecting you to know. So, but we need to know what the behaviorist said. And they said they're looking at four characteristics of behaviorism. The first one would be imitation, practice, positive reinforcement, and habit formation. So, meaning that we copy. If, if the teacher, if you learn something and you copy it, copy it, it means that you have now officially learn something and that's not the way it works. So imitation, meaning the teacher says something and then the students repeat it. Uh, practice, if you practice that um, imitation, the child will then remember it. If you use positive reinforcement, you praise it, the child will then remember it. And if you do it constantly, habit formation, then the child will remember it. But we know we think it's gonna, that is the way it works, but it doesn't work that way. So Brooks 1960 and Lardo 1964 says, emphasize, you must emphasize mimicry and memorization, audio lingual teaching methods. So the child must uh, hear the language constantly. And for that reason, then the child will remember. But, um, so they're saying there the use of language drills, repeating language structures to make them automatic and habitual. So, and the behaviors continue by saying that this is the way language actually, um, how a child acquire language, but we should know by now that that is not the case. So using language drills, repeating language structures to make them automatic and habitual, it's not necessarily the 
the best way of, of how a child acquires a language. So the one criticism against the behaviorist is that the, it, the behaviorism does not explain how children are able to say things they have never heard, creating logical mistakes like mice. That where did they hear to say that, that mice is instead of mice or mouse, hold it, held. How do they how do they say hold it? They're supposed to say held. Okay, swimmed instead of saying swam, or tooth instead of saying teeth. Okay. How did they learn this? Because this is not necessarily um the correct way of going about it. One must really wonder. Um, it's not necessarily the correct way of going about it. and But the thing about the behaviorist is that they can't explain how a child might, will, will say, um, hold it, for example, when they've never heard it before. Yet they start out saying that. If you listen to children, they would sometimes wonder why they say put it or hold it or um, um, uh, uh, it's strange words that they not that I've never ever heard before. And I mean, here's an example of what I mean. I put the plates on the table, and then the child said, "You mean I put the plates on the table?" And the child insists, "No, I put it them on all by myself." So how is it possible that they have learned how to say "put it," yet they've never heard it before? Okay, and in the natural environment, it was not something that a teacher would have uh, said in a lesson plan, but yet they insist on using these types of words. And this is the one thing that the behaviorist can't explain. So we're going to look at the next theory, which is innatism, and it's all in your mind. This is how they believe acquisition of a language happens. So they said, and one of the uh, great believers in innatism is Chomsky. And he argues that behaviorism, the one that we've just looked at, cannot provide sufficient explanations for children's language acquisition for the following reasons. Okay, Firstly, children know more about language structure than they could learn based on what they hear. So they hear things, but somehow they know a lot more about it. And how is that possible? Because as I've said uh, uh, during my previous slide, I said to you that they've never heard the word put it, but yet they know the meaning. They, they somehow have formed an understanding that put it is the correct word, okay? So let's go further. Children are exposed to language that includes false starts, incomplete sentences. So there are a lot of children are exposed to language that includes false starts, incomplete sentences, yet they learn to distinguish between grammatically correct and incorrect sentences. They, they have not been exposed to correct or incorrect language sentences, but yet they know how to correct themselves. And obviously the behaviorist says that the only way the child can learn a language is if by imitation, copying, repeating, da 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 da, da. And then the natism says, no, that can't be, because if that is the case, how will a child understand that the word put it because they've never heard it before yet they are saying it. So what, do, what does that mean? It means that children are not systematically corrected instruction on language by parents. You know, they've, they, they, if they learn something wrong, it's not necessarily coming from a parent. So where have they, where does it come from? So let's look at language acquisition here, born to use language. And this is what innatism says. They're criticizing the behaviorist because they're saying it doesn't make sense. So innatism says there's a sequence of how a child learns the language. Children are biologically programmed for language. That's number one. So there's, it's like your DNA. You are bi bi biologically trained, um, programmed for a language. They're also saying that language develops in the child. And then the last one is in the same way of other biological functions. So there's a sequence of how a child acquires a language. So 
Learning to speak a language is equal to learning to walk. So learning to speak essentially is exactly it's part of our DNA. And, and, and that it's, it works exactly the same way as we would look at learning how to walk. So it's a very interesting concept, but very and very different from what the behaviorists are saying. So let's look at it. Innate, uh, the, the in, um, um, innatism believes that we are born with an innate language acquisition device. And so what does that mean? It's an innate language ability. It's like a black box containing universal grammatical principles that applies to human language. So they're saying that all of us, when we are born, we have this language acquisition device, it's this black box that's filled with language and we just need to activate it. So there's a black box. And then they're saying, the natives says that all that's needed is to activate the device. The LID is being exposed to the language. So you just need to be exposed to a language and that a language acquisition device will be opened and it absorption happen. So children will automatically begin acquiring language of the environment. So once it's open, you will discover that the children just absorb language. So the language acquisition device must be activated in the critical period of language, the language of learning, and that will happen before puberty. Okay, so before puberty, which means that um, in order for a child to learn a language, they need to be exposed to that language before puberty. And I think this can explain a wonderful concept, which is why is it so easy for a child to learn a language, but it's so difficult for an adult to learn the language. Now, the innatus says that, um, innatism says, is that the best way, the critical period uh, to open up this box, this language acquisition device, would be before uh, before puberty. Okay, so what is the evidence to support innatism? Okay, virtually all children successfully learn their mother tongue at a time in their life when they would not be expected to learn something else so complicated, i.e. biologically programmed. Yeah, sometimes we wonder, where did the, 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 the two-year-old hear these words? Uh, where did they hear the, the three-year-old? It, it's amazing how children can just have an understanding of words that they might never have heard before. And that is basically what it says. Virtually all children successfully learn their mother tongue at a time in their life when they would not be expected to learn something, something else so complicated. So i.e. biologically programmed. So for example, when you look at a child, you will see that the, the milestone, developmental milestone in terms of language would be at three months, they will be googling and gurgling. And then at six months, they would be babbling. At 12 months, they, they will use their first words. At 18 months, they know five to 40 words in two years, 150 to 300 words, and so forth. So how is it possible that they can learn all these words uh, and not really been exposed to so many words? And that's just what they call the language acquisition device. There's this box that assists them to learn a language. Okay, so how universal grammar works for second language learners. So that is how your understanding of how universal grammar works for a first language, but we are gonna focus on second language acquisition. Now, there are two different views. The first view is that universal grammar may be present and available to second language learners, but its exact nature has been altered by prior acquisition of the first language. Now, the first language you automatically uh, acquire, you know, you have the black box, there's a language acquisition device, you somehow can just um, correct yourself uh, because somehow that part has been activated. But they're saying what uh, Krashen is, uh, what, what the innatism is saying is that 
they, in your, when it comes to your second language acquisition, the universal grammar may be present and available to the second language learners, but its exact nature has been altered by prior acquisition of the first language. So there's a slight difference uh, when it comes to acquisition of a first language and acquisition of a second language. And this is where we, we have to take that into consideration. Second language learners need some explicit information about what is not grammatical in their second language. So I'll explain that to you a little bit further. Otherwise, may assume second language learners may assume that some structures of the first language have equivalence in second language when they do not. Okay, and we're going to talk about that a little bit further. For example, in um, certain indigenous languages, for example, the he, she word is not, uh, there's not a distinct difference between he, she. For he, she, they might call it one word. So that might be how they acquire language in their first language. But when it comes to the second language, which may be English, where there's a distinction between he, she, um, the person might be confused, okay? So what they are saying that learners, then if that happens, learners need some, learners need some grammatical, uh, otherwise they need some explicit information about what is not grammatical in the L2, okay? So for instance, saying worms instead of wormer, trees won't work in Afrikaans. And saying flichtes or flichtea instead of flichtea, airplanes, will earn a few smiles from your Afrikaans friends. So yes, you have acquired the universal grammar in your first language, you're very comfortable with it. But if, when it comes to second language acquisition, because in order for you to learn a second language, you would use your first language. But you must remember that sometimes the language structures will differ. Di differ. And it's your role as a teacher to teach these students, these learners, the differences. And that's what it means, OK? So the fourth theory is would be interactionalism. And this belief, believe children learn their that first language through a combination of init and environmental factors. So say they also saying, yes, there's an init factor. So they believe in, in what Chomsky is saying, saying, but they're also saying that there's an environment, environmental factors as well. So child's, a child's inborn capacity to develop language is cru crucial and language a child hears from adults in her world, okay? So yes, there's an innate ability to hear language, but let's go further. By time of primary education, learners have already acquired their first language, which we've said because they're born with it. There's this language acquisition device, there's this box, they've acquired the first language, but most encounter a second or third additional language at school. And this might be tricky for them. As I've said, they do not acquire the second or the additional language exactly the same as they would acquire the first language. So the first fifth theory that we're gonna look at would be second language learning theories, and that will be Krashen. Again, remember we mentioned him in the first slide, if you look, go back to the first slide, you will see him there and that he is a very interesting man. And he looked specifically at second language learning theories and how that works. Um, Krashen says the theory of second language learning. And again, there pages 48 to 50 in your Ferreira book. So they are saying that acquisition that acquisition happens in a certain way or second language learning happens in a certain way. The first one is the acquisition learning hypothesis. The second one is the monitor hypothesis. The third one is a natural order hypothesis. The fourth one, input hypothesis. And the fifth one would be the effective filter hypothesis. So what do we mean? This is Krashen's theory and he says, this is how we acquire second language learning theories, how we acquire second language. He says, there would be 
acquisition versus learning. There will be a natural order hypothesis. There will be a monetary hypothesis, input hypothesis, and the Fichte fault hypothesis. And we're going to discuss that a little bit more in detail. Now, Krashen is a very interesting. These theories are extremely interesting, especially second language acquisition theories. And we're going to discuss this now. So acquisition requires meaningful interaction in the target language the nat natural communication in which speakers are concerned not with the form of the utterances, but the message they are conveying and understanding. So basically it says, uh, you know, people should not, we should not acquire a language by, um, you know, rules, too, too many rules and regulations. We should acquire a language by having meaningful interaction in the target language, okay? So natural communication. So if a child is acquiring a second language, it's also important that they must be able to understand the rules. Yes, a little bit of grammatical rules, but they must also be able to apply these rules. So there must be meaningful interactions when they do that, okay? Let's go on. So the first hypothesis would be the actual acquisition learning hypothesis. And he says acquisition is the product of a subconscious process, very similar to the process children go through in acquiring their first language. So he says the second language also is a subconscious process many a times. It's very similar to how a child acquires the first language. So learning is a form, product of formal instruction, which is a conscious process resulting in conscious knowledge about the language. So yes, he agrees that acquisition is a subconscious process, but learning is a formal instruction. It's a conscious process, okay? So that is what we need to be remembering about the acquisition learning hypothesis. The third one is the monet hypothesis. And monet explains the relationship between acquisition and learning and defines the influence of learning on acquisition. So how do we monitor? Monitor is the speaker's ability to check and correct languages as they are using it. So they can monitor themselves as they are using the language. First language speakers monitor without even being aware of it as they have acquired a feel for the language correctness. Sometimes I would, um, speak English and I can see mm, I did not say the correct word here and there but I can monitor myself because I am very comfortable because I'm an English first language speaker the same thing will apply with an Afrikaans first language speaker and also or an Isitlosa first language speaker it's almost like your mind <laughs> has the ability to check and correct language as they're using it so they have a feel for the language Second language learners, speakers have to know the grammar rules and have to do this consciously to repair while speaking. So yes, first language speakers can do this automatically, but there's a distinction between first and second language is that language speakers is that they have to um, question, they have to repair um, the, the, the speaker have to understand the grammar rules and have to do this consciously, consciously to repair while speaking. This is hard work. So learners need time to stop and think about language, okay? So for first languages, it's automatic normally. They, they have, they can correct themselves immediately. Second languages, yes, they also sometimes can do it that way, but they also need instruction. They need to understand the rules of the second in the second language in order to be able to do it. So that's very interesting. So the third hypothesis is a natural order hypothesis. And so we please remember we're still speaking about um, Stephen Krashen, and he says a natural order is based on research findings, Delay and Bert, which suggested that the acquisition of grammatical structures follows a natural order which is predictable. Acquire English second language starting with ing and forming the plural quite easily and then start 
using a and the finally the possessive so again remember we talked about there's this natural order how we acquire language and this is the what they're saying how we acquire a second language we acquire english second language starting with the i and g and forming the plurals quite early and then start using the a and the the and finally the possessive so the possessive again here is a bit difficult for both first and second language students to acquire but then this sequence is similar across all language learning, making it predictable or natural order that teachers could use to sequence language teaching activities. So yes, um, they're saying that normally this happens when you teach all second language learners, and it's very important to remember that. Now, we're going to look at now the language acquisition order would be Brown, 1973, U.S. Learning. So this is how we learn a first language. We normally learn the ing first, then the plurals, but then we learn the possessive, and then the third present person singular present tense. Okay, remember that we discussed this earlier. Okay, so it starts with the ing, then it goes on to the third person singular that with the s, and then it goes to the possessives and then the auxiliary. Now, when it comes to learning a second language, it's a bit different, okay? They all saying with the second language, the ing starts first. They learn the ing first, okay? Then they learn the third person singular present tense, and then they learn the possessive. So now we're going to look at the input hypothesis, explains how learners acquire a second language. Learners improve and progress along the natural order when they receive second language input or comprehensible input. So this must be one step beyond the current stage of linguistic competence. So when you're looking at the linguistic competence of, of students, maybe they know how to, uh, they understand, for example, proper nouns or they understand the, in, the direct and indirect speech. What, they, what they're suggesting is that as a teacher, you need to give the students a little bit more work to do. So a little bit more input hypothesis so that they learn something new. And that's basically, if input is the information that the student already know, which is the I plus two, it will be, be too far above their level of competence and would be too difficult to comprehend and of no benefit. So you need to be very aware if you're going to do this input hypothesis that you understand where your students are in terms of their second language, but you will give them something a little bit more um, difficult, you know, let them reach another difficult level, but only do it one at a time. You can't, so it's information plus one new thing that they need to learn. You can't also just do information and you give plus two. That will be very difficult for them then to learn the language. The hypothesis suggests that to be fluent is not something that can be explicitly taught, okay? So for example, uh, information that a second language learner already has, but you add two new things, that will be too difficult for the student. If you have information plus one, you will see the smiley face there because they're learning something new. But if it's information, the current level of competence or the um, uh, information plus zero, they're learning nothing new, the child will be bored, okay? So we're continuing with the input hypothesis. It's being criticized um, as hypothesis, as it suggests learners are passively receiving input without actively being engaged and providing output. Yes, that's, that's a huge problem. It's, it's a good thing that the teacher gives the student a lot of input, so information, but unfortunate, and they add it, but the other thing that's important is that the student must actually uh, also be interacting in the classroom, okay? Learners need to listen and read. So if you are gonna give them a listening exercise, then you mu they must also then be able to, they must then get a reading exercise where they do the activities, but also to speak and write. So if they're gonna speak something, you're teaching them how to speak, they must also then be able to write it, okay? So input hypothesis, um, um, 
looking at if you are teaching a learner a listening the teachers teaching this the learners a listening exercise that will be input the output would be then be for the students to speak if they are learning if you are teaching them a reading exercise you must also then that the learners must then learn how to write because it it this hypothesis essentially saying is that it needs to be interactive. It cannot be where the teacher speaks alone, but there's no activity for the for the learner. Now, the last one would be the effective filter hypothesis, and that would be the number of effective variables play a role in second language acquisition. And what are these variables? Include that these variables will be motivation, self-confidence, and anxiety. So as a teacher, you need to be able to motivate your students. You need to increase self-confidence. And if you do that, the, so the learner will not have anxiety. So learners with high motivation, self-confidence, a good self-image, and a low level of anxiety are better equipped for success in second language acquisition. So that is a reality. Um, you need to be able to motivate them, uh, increase their self-confidence and create a good self-image, okay? Low motivation, low self-esteem and anxiety can combine to raise the effect of filter. So uh, students will not be feel comfortable or have the confidence so it will increase the effect of filter and form a mental block that prevents comprehensible input from being used for acquisition. So I've read about this last night. I mean, look at this person, um, but I can't remember the answer. What was it? Oh, no, no. And we don't want learners that's going to look like that. And then the teacher will also not get the best results and she will also be, will then lose her motivation. So Krashen's model, if you look at the five hypotheses, it says there needs to be comp comprehensible input. Thereafter, there needs to be an effective filter. Okay. So the learners, second language learners need to have a lesson. There has to be an effective filter. So this filter means that they're going to learn something new. Then they will have acquired knowledge. And then learn acquired knowledge. So with learned knowledge will give them an output, which is positive. So we're almost done. Um, so let's just, how do people acquire language? We're just gonna do a few examples here. A quick menti quiz on language learning. Um, if I go back there, languages are learned mainly through imitation. Is that right or wrong? All children acquire language regardless of circumstances. So these are just a quick mentor quiz that you can do on your own. And if you go to Canvas, you'll see this is how it will work. You just have to move your from, the, it's a slide. You, you just need to move it from one side to the other. And that, that's how you will answer your questions. So yes, I hope you are happy with this lecture, um, this recording. And please let me know if you have any queries, you can email me, I will be available.